Well, it's a great morning to be together today. Uh, I'd like to start with, uh, if it, does everybody have an outline? If you don't have an outline, our ushers would be happy to give you one. Now, the last few weeks, or actually the last couple months, we've been talking about the fruit of the Spirit. The other pastors have done a pretty good job, wouldn't you say? Yeah, okay. That wasn't a ringing endorsement, but I, that might be because you guys are still waking up. But we've been talking about living from the inside out, allowing the Holy Spirit to work through us and to display this fruit. Okay? And this week we are talking about the fruit of faithfulness. Faithfulness. Now, I would like to ask everybody to turn to Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1. Now, a simple definition of faithfulness. Faithfulness is holding firm to your beliefs and being reliable in your actions. Holding firm to your beliefs and being reliable in your actions. Now, when I think of faithfulness, just in general, not specifically spiritual, okay, I think of a few things, of people and things that are faithful, reliable, okay, loyal. Now, for our younger crowd, uh, I think of which avenger is a faithful avenger, and that would be Captain America. I think, oh, there he is, right there, Captain America. Captain America is faithful to his country, faithful to his friends. He knows what he's supposed to do and he does it. Now when I think in history of a president that displayed faithfulness, I think of President Abraham Lincoln. He did what was right even when it wasn't popular. Now when I think of every day of somebody who is faithful that I see is my postman. Now, my postman actually comes to church here. Some of you may know him. His name is Dick Danielson. And he does a pretty good job when he's not sleeping on the job and when he shows up. No, he does a great job. Great job. He, through what they say, rain, sleet, and snow, they deliver the mail, right? And then I, when I think of what is a car that's reliable, in the past 30 years, the Honda Civic, Right? If you have one of those Honda Civics right there that from the 80s, it is still running well. It is still going, okay? So now if we transition to this, are you a dependable person? Can others count on you? Do people believe that you will do what you say you will do? Now, being faithful in your job is a great witnessing tool. If you show up to work, that's, that's a plus. If you show up to work on time, they're amazed, Right? And so you can stand out in a good way if you have a good work ethic. But what we're going to focus on today is being faithful to God. Okay? Faithful to God. And are you reliable to Him? Are you loyal to God? Do you make promises to God that you don't deliver on? Can God count on you? Well, in Job here... Job was a faithful man. Now if we look in verse 1, it says, There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless, upright, fearing God, and turning away from evil. Does that sound faithful? Fearing God, blameless, turning from evil? Yes. So he was faithful. Things are going great though. He's got 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 oxen, 500 donkeys, many servants. God has blessed him with seven sons and three daughters. Things are going perfectly. Well, then there's a conversation that goes on there in Job chapter 1 between God and Satan. And God says, have you considered my servant Job? Look what he does. He's blameless. He fears God. He does what's right. Satan says, well, if you take everything he has, psh, he's not going to follow you anymore. He's not going to be faithful to you. So God allows Satan to take everything from Job. And one day, right one after another, Job loses all his animals. That's his wealth. Loses all his animals. Loses his servants. And worst of all, he loses all ten children. They are killed in a tornado. They're having a birthday party. And they're all killed. And Job finds out about each one of these. And then we come to 
a very famous part of Scripture. Job chapter 1, verse 21. Job chapter 1, verse 21. Job said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And through all this, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God. So Job was faithful before all the bad things happened. Job's faithful after. Well, we go in chapter 2. Now, again, God and Satan have this conversation. And God says, look, even though you in, you, I allowed you to do this, he still remained faithful to me. And, Job, and Satan says, you know what? If you take away his health, he's going to turn on you. So God allows him to do whatever he wants, except he cannot take his life. And Job is smitten with these boils all over his body. He is in agony. There is nothing that relieves the agony he is in. He's in a constant pain. He's lost everything. And then his wife comes on the scene here. And his wife in Job chapter 2 verse 9 says, his wife said to him, do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God and not accept adversity? In all this, Job did what? Did not sin with his lips. Again. You now his wife is saying, Give it up. Why should we be faithful to God anymore? But Job was like, Hey, can we only accept good? Can't we accept bad from God? The God we know, the God we trust, we can trust him when things are going good and when things are going bad. Powerful response. Powerful response. I believe that our trust in God and his word directly affects our faithfulness to him. Our trust in God and his word directly affects our faithfulness to him. And we, as we go through this, we're going to find that. The trust, okay, the trust in his word and the belief in his word and the belief in him. Now, I think a great place to start is God is perfect in his faithfulness to us. How many of you believe that? God is perfect in his faithfulness to us. All right. We've got some hands raised. How, do we have any amens? Amen. All right. Very good. Isaiah chapter 25, verse 1. O oh Lord, you are my God, I will exalt you. I will give thanks to your name, for you have worked wonders, plans formed long ago with perfect faithfulness. God is perfect in his faithfulness to us. Lamentations chapter 2 says, The Lord's love and kindness indeed never cease, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. We sang that song earlier, talking about how great God is in his faithfulness. God never has a bad day, right? God never has a bad day. God's never in a bad mood. God's, he's always willing to show us mercy and grace and love. He's ready to, for us to talk to him. We can count on God. God, we never have to worry, worry about God. Are you going to uh, remember to bring the sun up this morning? I hope God doesn't forget. Or, or God, are you going to make sure that, that the earth is still spinning? Because I'd be really worried that if you forgot something like that. No, God is faithful to that. God is faithful to us. His son was faithful to death. Philippians chapter 2 talks about this. Verse 8, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. Even death on a cross. For this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every other name. Jesus was faithful to us enough to die on the cross for us. He had a choice though. He could have said, you know what, I don't deserve any of this. But you know what? He went through with it. Even though he didn't deserve it, even though it was going to be painful and agony, he went through it for us. God deserves our faithfulness. Wouldn't you agree? If anybody that we, 
we, ha- we run into every day, and anybody in the world deserves faithfulness, it's God. So let's talk about three points of being faithful, okay? First one is faithfulness is living with an unwavering confidence in God. An unwavering confidence in God. A lot of times we use the word trust. That's found throughout the Bible. Faith in God, right? What is faith and trust? It's confidence. It is unwavering confidence in God and who he is. James 1, 6 talks about somebody who doesn't have this confidence. He mu- but he must ask in faith without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. David Wilkerson, a quote from him says, You cannot be faithful to God if you allow any unbelief to take root in your heart. Now that doesn't mean you don't have doubts. We all have doubts at times. But if we allow unbelief to take root in our heart, what does that transition into? It transitions into unfaithfulness. Have you allowed fear or doubt to creep into your heart? Has your Christian walk been replaced with a childlike faith in him to now questioning, being cynical of God? Unbelief is very subtle. It sneaks in. Sneaks into our life. Hebrews chapter 3 talks about this. Paul is, is, is warning his these brothers take care brothers that there not be in any of you an un- evil unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God but encourage one another day after day as long as it is called today why because so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin for we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our insurance firm until the end Paul's warning, he's saying, make sure you don't let any unbelief, any doubt sneak into your heart and your life. Because then your heart becomes hardened. Oswald Chambers says, it is only a faithful person who truly believes that God sovereignly controls his circumstances. We take our circumstances for granted. We say, God's in control, but not really believing it. We act as if the things that happen were completely controlled by people. Isn't that true? Sometimes that we've learned what Christian words we're supposed to say or Christian phrases. And and they are important and they're true. But we'll say God has a reason. God has a purpose. And we say it, but we don't really believe it. You know what I'm talking about? We say it and we, we don't really really truly trust we'll talk about it we'll say it because it's the right thing to say but what God wants us to do is to truly believe and be fully confident in him and what he can do when circumstances happen do you allow yourself to be pushed by the waves of doubt or do you remain confident in God and his plans now Abraham Abraham was a faithful man but Abraham just like everybody else had struggles When Abraham and his wife were coming to Pharaoh, Abraham thought, man, my wife is gorgeous. And if Pharaoh sees her and finds out that's my wife, Pharaoh is getting rid of me very quickly. So he tells Sarah, lie about who you are. Just say that you're my sister. And God intervenes, fortunately. But he didn't trust God right there. But there are two situations that the reason Abraham made it into the hall of faith, right? The hall of faith, the fame hall of faith. uh, And the two situations are, first of all, we find this where God asked Abraham to leave his home. And Abraham obeyed. Well, the amazing thing is, if you read Hebrews 11, 8, Hebrews 11, 8, by faith Abraham, when he was called, Obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive an inheritance. He went out, and and what does it say there? Not knowing where he was going. Abraham, God didn't tell him, hey, Abraham, you're going to move to the land of Canaan. It's it's a great place. I'm going to take care of you. God says, follow me. And what did he do? He followed. Now, as you, some of you may know the story, God had promised Abraham and Sarah a son. 
And through this son, many, many descendants, the nation of Israel will come from this son. And they got up, it wasn't until they were 100 years old that they had their baby. And it was the promised son. It was Isaac. And Isaac was born, and things were going great. And he grew up. Uh, around the teenage years, God out of the blue says, um, Abraham, I want you to sacrifice your son Isaac. What? Abraham doesn't even, in the Bible we see, he doesn't question God. He takes his son Isaac, him and, his, and a servant, and they go up to the mountain where they're going to sacrifice Isaac. He, he ties Isaac up. He, he gets ready to kill him. And God intervenes and tells him, hey, I, I, I see that, that you, you are faithful to me. Hebrews eleven seventeen through 19 talks about how Abraham was able to do this. It says, by faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son. It was to he whom it was said, in Isaac your descendants shall be called. Now listen to what Abraham considered. He considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead, from which he also re received him back as a type. So Abraham was able to do this because he thought, God can raise Isaac back from the dead, or God will provide another sacrifice. You see how that confidence he had in God? Even God was asking him to do something completely crazy, he was still able to trust in him. You cannot be fickle in your belief. We have to remain faithful in our trust in God. Now that's the first part. The second part is faithfulness is being loyal to the truth of God's word. Loyal to the truth of God's word. We're loyal to a lot of things. But are we loyal to God's word? Psalm 119.11 talks about God's word. Your word have I treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you. How are we able to be faithful? By treasuring God's word. Psalm 119 talks about, uh, verse 20, the sum of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous ordinances is everlasting. What power there is in that statement. The sum of God's word, what you add up, when you bring all God's word, you add it all up, it equals truth. It equals truth. So that's why we got to be very careful that we don't choose parts of the Bible that we don't believe, parts of the Bible we don't obey, because the sum of God's word is all truth, right? Now, we have the president's oath here, president oath of office, and, oh, did I skip ahead? Sorry, hey, we can go back to that here quick. A weak view of God's word will create a life of unfaithfulness. If we, if we can't count on God's word, if we don't have a strong view of God's word, that's going to equal unfaithfulness. Now, the president's oath, okay? It says here, I do solemnly swear... Or affirm that I will faithfully execute the office of the President of the United States and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Is that important? Yeah, very important to our country. Sometimes we think presidents have kind of forgot what their job is, right? We need to remind them that they, con that they are to protect the Constitution. Let's transition to that. What if we had a Christian oath? of office that we took as we became a disciple of Christ. It might be something like this. I do solemnly swear or affirm that I will faithfully execute the position of a disciple of Christ and will through the power of the Holy Spirit preserve, protect, and defend the word of God. We should defend the word of God. We should preserve and protect it. Very important. It's important in your family. It's important as an individual. It's important in this church that we protect the word of God and the truth of God's word. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Paul is talking about, and 
How many of you have had your kids in Awana? Do we have any, anybody? Okay. Well, this is the verse that Awana comes from. If you ever understand, where did they come up with the word A-W-A-N-A? It's this verse right here. Be diligent to present yourselves. Here it is. Approve to God as a workman. That's Awana. Prove to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. But avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead further to ungodliness. And listen to this. Their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenus and Philetus, men who have gone astray from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already taken place, and they have upset the faith of some. We must stay loyal to God's word. Now, we come from all different backgrounds here, and that's great, isn't it? Everybody from, it doesn't matter what kind of, what kind of economical background, spiritual background, where, where you came from, you're part of God's family when you come to this church. And we want you to be here. But we come from different backgrounds, and what we have to be careful with is we have may, came from a different religion. Our parents may have taught us different things. We may have learned things through school and different things. And we have these certain beliefs that we hold to. And we become a believer in Jesus Christ. We trust in him. And sometimes those beliefs counter what God's words say and when they counter in God's words we try to take our beliefs and we try to change God's word to make it fit what belief we already had and we can't do that we've got to start with God's word we got to surrender our beliefs to what God's words say the culture today is constantly attacking God's word the culture says we have evolved. There is no creator. And whoever believes in creation is unintelligent and uninformed. God's word says everything was created in six days. We cannot try to change God's word in order to fit what science says. Our culture says that Jesus is the only, if you say that Jesus is the only way to heaven, it's intolerant and arrogant. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The only way to the Father is through me. Our culture says homosexuality is just another lifestyle. People are born that way and have no choice. God clearly calls homosexuality a sin. Our culture says that the Bible is an outdated book for weak-minded people. God says his word is everlasting. And is truth to, it was truth yesterday, it was truth 2,000 years ago, and it is still the truth now. A survey from Barna tw says 25% of those who say they are born again Christians said all people are eventually saved or accepted by God. Now where did that come from? We don't see that in scripture. We see it though in the culture. The culture of changing what people believe and what they think. Faithfulness, we've talked about the first two of being faithful. Here's the third point. Faithfulness is denying myself daily in order to fully follow Christ. Deny myself daily in order to fully follow Christ. Following Christ is not easy. Sometimes we think that because, hey, I'm supposed to put my trust in Christ. I trust him to save me. And that's, that's easy, isn't it? But following Christ, surrendering your life to him, that can be hard. Luke 9, 23, Jesus said, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must, what? Deny himself. Take up his cross daily and follow me. That means when you put to death, it's not all about me anymore. It's not all about my wants, my desires. It's about God and what he wants from my life. Now, if we truly trust in God, we say, yeah, I may be giving up things, but God's going to replace them with better things. Are you a fan or a follower? 
A fan or a follower? Now, you may be wondering, what am I talking about? Well, think of a fan. Let's think about, about uh, the Huskers, okay? Ha- see, football season's coming soon, and I know I'm getting excited. I always do. We get all, and we get hyped up, and this year's going to be the year, and then we usually get disappointed. <laughs> Hope, but maybe this is the year, okay? <laughs> but a fan, a fan, we put in our time. I mean, we, we may... We may get some food all ready for our football party. We may even pay for tickets, but most of the time we're just cheering. We're cheering or we're grumbling, right? And we're a fan. We've, we think we're very important, okay? But who, we don't ever go to a practice. We don't help them with their game plan. We don't put any blood or sweat or work into it. And if they're losing, oh, man, they're really getting beat. I'm going to switch the channel. I don't have to watch this anymore. That's a fan. You see that? Sometimes we're that way with church too. We come in, we're a fan. We're we're a great admirer of Jesus. We come and we celebrate and we have a party and we cheer on Jesus. And then we go the rest of the week and it's a totally different because we're only a fan. A follower puts their time into it. A follower is sacrificing. I would recommend this book. If you haven't read this book, I'd recommend it to everybody in here. It's from Kyle Eidelman, Not a Fan. Jesus isn't saying, I want to be first in your life. He is saying, I don't want there to even be a second place. When we compare our relationship with him to anyone else, there should be no competition. Fans will try and make Jesus one of many. Some fans may even make Jesus the first of many. But when Jesus defines the relationship, he wants to be your one and only. That's powerful, isn't it? It's convicting to me, too. It speaks to my heart about where I'm at. We see in Revelation 2, 4, it talks about this, but who or what is your first love? Who or what is your first love? Revelation 2, verse 4 This is talking about a church. I have this against you, that you have left your first love. You've replaced your first love with something else or somebody else. And God says, I want you to be my first love. I want your attention, your devotion, your love. I want you to be excited about me. There There was a man who came up to Jesus and asked about eternal life. He says, what, what must I do to get eternal life? And Jesus is kind of testing him out. And he says, have you followed the commandments, the Ten Commandments? And he says, yeah, I've done a pretty good job of keeping all those commandments. I've done right. Then Jesus says, well, he says, one thing you lack, go and sell all you possess, give to the poor, And you will have treasure in heaven. Come, follow me. But at these words, he was saddened. And he went away grieving. For he was one who owned much property. This isn't about whether you're rich or poor. God's not saying that everyone here needs to sell what they have. Some of us say, I don't have much to sell. (laughs) What this is talking about is this man, his first love was his money. And he says, God, I'll give up whatever you want. But I am not giving up this. And we're that way too. God speaks to us and he says, hey, I want you to give this up. And we're saying, God, I'll give you anything. You can have this, 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 but this is mine and I'm keeping it. God says, who's your first love? We will be faithful to our spouse. Good thing, right? Yeah, you can elbow the, if you have a spouse next to you, you can elbow them. It's good to be faithful to your wife your husband, faithful at work, we talked about that, faithful as a father, as a parent, but we totally forget about being faithful to God, God's the one who can be the one, hey, God, yeah, I forgot, but God's not the one who's now being, who's getting sad because, and and who's telling us over and over again, "Hey, hey, you forgot to call me today, you forgot to talk to me today, he can be easily ignored, the parable of the talents is found in Matthew chapter 25. The, 
the master, and I'm actually going to have you turn to one other place. Matthew chapter 25 is the first book in the New Testament. I'm sorry I do not have the page for it in the Bible in front of you. But Matthew chapter 25, and we're going to be looking at verse 14. This is a parable, that, a story that Jesus was telling. The master was leaving for a journey, and so he gave three of his servants different amounts of money. Okay, and it says he called all his, his servants and trusted his possessions to them. To one he gave them five talents, to another two, to another one, each according to his ability. Immediately the one who had received the five talents went and traded and gained five more talents. In the same manner, the one who had received the two talents gained two more, and he who received the one talent dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, the, the master came back, and he was settling his accounts with them. The one who had received the five talents came up and brought five more talents, saying, Master, you entrusted five talents to me. See, I have five more. Then the person with the two talents came up and said, Hey, I doubled what you gave me. Here's two more. And then we come to the person with the one. The one who had received the one talent came up and said, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, gathering where you scattered no seed. I was afraid, and so I hid your talent in the ground. See, here's, what, here's yours, what you gave me. And the master said, You wicked, lazy slave. You knew that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have put my money in the bank, and I would have at least received interest. Therefore, take away the talent from him and to the one who has ten talents. What the master said to the person who got the five more and the two more was, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. If Christ came back this week, and he says, what have you done for me? What have you done with what I have given you? What would we say? Would we be able to say, yeah, God, look at this. I am faithful to you. I have used my talents to serve you. I, have, I, have, I am all in, God. I have completely followed her. Or would we would be saying, well, God, I do go to church sometimes. I went to church and, and I encourage you to think about, think about that. Think about how this life is going to end quickly for each one of us compared to eternity. Eternity is what it's all about. If I have an unwavering confidence in God and am loyal to the truth of God's word, I will demonstrate a loyal devotion to him. Unwavering confidence in God and am loyal to the truth of God's word. I will demonstrate a loyal devotion to him. And I do want to go back and ask you that question. Are you a fan or a follower? You may have made a decision when you were young. You raised your hand. You went forward. And that's all that's happened since then. You can say, I have really never grown since then. Maybe you need to surrender your life to God. Say, God, I'm all in now. Maybe... Maybe you're saying, God, I'm faithful, but not in all things. I've, I'm, I'm holding tight on to something. I encourage you as we pray to surrender whatever you're holding tight to. And again, this works through the Holy Spirit. If we surrender, allow the Holy Spirit to work through us. We can't do it on our own. We must allow God to work through us. Let's go to God in prayer. As we go to God in prayer... If you have yet to surrender your life to God, to put your full trust in Him as your Savior, I encourage you to do that right where you're at. It's not by the prayer, but it's by your belief in Him. You can simply pray this prayer. Dear Jesus, please forgive me of all my sins. Jesus, I want to surrender my life to You. I know You are the only one who can save me from my sins. Please come into my life. I receive your gift of your son, Jesus. 
God, we hold tightly on to so many things, God. We replace you with other things. God, I just pray you would work in our hearts that we would surrender and we would allow you to be part of all, every part of our life, God. That we would be faithful to you. That we would have unwavering confidence in you. That we would be loyal to your words. And God, I pray that we would deny ourselves and fully follow you. God, I just thank you for your faithfulness to us. Thank you that we can always count on you. Thank you for your great love for us. Thank you for this church, God. I just pray that your blessing would be on us and that your Holy Spirit would work through us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.